Good morning to those uh, that are watching online. My name is Jerry Scazzaro, and I'm part of the staff team here at New Life. Um, and actually in the Emotionally Healthy Discipleship Department. Actually, all the staff are in the Emotionally Healthy Discipleship Department. Uh, but we put a little bit more uh, work into that whole strategy. Uh, we've been in a series on the authentic life, uh, really, which is synonymous for being a disciple or follower of Christ. And so since it's baseball season, I want to share an illustration with you from baseball and with our very own, oh, can you guys move that slide for me? Charlie Brown, okay? <laughs> the famous American comic strip character. So imagine Charlie Brown in his baseball uniform. And uh, he's in the weeds in right field. The weeds are over his head, he can't see. They're so over his head, and he's talking to himself. In the first frame, he says, I don't mind they put me in right field where they put the poorest player in the game. In the second frame, he's saying, I don't mind that my parents came to see me play and they won't see me. In the third frame, he says, I don't mind that if they hit a ball, I wouldn't be able to see it to catch it. And in the final frame, he says, but I do mind that I don't know if I'm even turned in the right direction. Okay? Being a disciple of Christ and living an authentic life means being turned in the right direction. There are many times in our life when the weeds are going to be up over us and we can't see. But at least we want to know we're turned in the right direction direction. Discipleship is not a program. Discipleship is a life journey, a lifetime journey. And again, since it's a lifetime journey, it's really important that we know we're turned in the right direction. Today's passage is going to be about a blind man who gets healed and can see. This book, which the series was based on the principles in this book, The Emotionally Healthy Woman, which is really for men and women, but they named it woman because women buy 70% of the books. It used to be called I Quit, but I recommend it to everyone. And this book was birthed out of my own blindness. I had been a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ for 17 years before I devastatingly realized the depth of my own blindness. I, uh, I came to see that although I had thought that I was pretty anchored in the gospel and God's love, when the rubber hit the road, in most experiences in my life, my identity, who I was and how I responded to things was more based not on the love of God, but on what other people thought of me. In other words, my okayness came more from, were you okay with me? Uh, I also was blind to my propensity for blaming others. I was blind to how much I ignored or denied or repressed certain emotions, especially anger, sadness, fear. And I was, I was blind to how much I lied. Because again, if, if you are uh, getting your okayness from other people, if you're afraid of what other people think, you're definitely lying. You're definitely denying. And so uh, being a follower of Christ, I found out, is really about seeing. I mean, for 17 years, I, really, I was very committed in following Christ very seriously, but I still had large areas of my life not changed, especially on the inside. <clears throat> and so being a follower of Christ is about seeing. It's about actually being able to say, I am blind and now I see. Now, at conversion, if some of us had distinct conversion experiences, others of us have had progressive 
or whatever, whatever stage of faith uh, we were in when we realized that Christ, we want Christ to be Lord of our life, that's usually a very eye-opening experience and moment. But that's only the beginning Discipleship is not a program. Discipleship is a lifetime journey. And it's a journey um, about ongoing seeing, ongoing sight into who I am, into who God is, and all the, thing that, all the things that God wants to reveal to me. So I think today's passage, we're going to look at it in a moment, today's passage about uh, Bartimaeus, a blind man who's healed, has a lot to teach you and I about what it looks like as followers of Christ to make sure we're turned in the right direction, regardless of what's going on around us and maybe even in us. Okay, so here's our passage, and I want you to pay attention as we read it to all the action verbs. All right, see if you can pick out the action verbs in this passage as we read. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, my teacher, let me see. So do you see, did you pick up some of those action verbs? Uh, The words like, He shouts, and he cries out even more loudly. He throws off his cloak. He he springs up. There's this sense of momentum and energy in Bartimaeus uh, around his need, even around his desperateness. And uh, so even though Bartimaeus is blind, he sees a lot. First of all, he sees that he's blind. He's blind. He's not in denial. He sees that he's blind, and he knows he's a beggar. He knows he's dependent on people around him for his needs. He also sees that those, some of those people um, are really not for him. Uh, they're going to keep him stuck. But he also sees that um, Jesus is near. And that's significant for two reasons. One, He can turn to him because he's near. And secondly, he grasps who Jesus is. When he calls him son of David, he's using an ancient term that meant the anointed one. But that is the one who brings healing and mercy. Now, when I'm feeling desperate, I want to turn to somebody who gets mercy. And so there's a lot going on. Bartimaeus, he sees a lot. So I think that there are three heart and mind postures that we can learn from this passage in Bartimaeus to make sure that you and I are always turned in the right direction in our following of Jesus. Now, before I go into those, I want to just mention something about miracles. When Jesus does miracles in the Bible, I mean, he's healing him, he's healing his physical eyesight. He was physically blind, and then he sees. When, he's, when someone can't walk, Jesus heals them physically, and then they can walk. Or he gives them their words back, or he gives them their hearing back, or he gives women their fertility back. When Jesus does this, though, it's not just a biological Miracle. Miracles are symbolic. They point to something other than than just the physical and the biological. 
In other words, when he opens, he opens eyes so that we can see more deeply and more clearly. That's why there's so many healings of blindness in the Bible. Or when he opens ears, it's so that we might hear his word more penetratively into our hearts. Or when he opens mouths, it's so that we can begin to see, see and sing of the glory of God around us. Or when he heals infertility, it's so that we might be all generative and now be creative and life-giving. When he heals the paralyzed, it's symbolic that he wants us to walk in freedom. So as we go into this passage, again, uh, three heart and mind postures that keep us in the right, turned in the right direction. The first one, oops, I forgot a third thing that he was, that he was aware of, that he saw, and that is that he needed mercy. Bartimaeus recognized that he needed mercy. Okay, so for us, uh, Bart- Bart- Bartimaeus knew that he, um, he was blind, he knew Jesus was near, and he knew he needed mercy. And I think those are three heart-mind postures that uh, we need in order to keep us turned in the right direction. So the first one is, I know I'm blind. In other words, can you say, I know I don't know. Or, I don't know what I don't know. A maturing disciple of Christ is actually able to take input and feedback from other people because we don't see ourselves objectively. One of the most mature things that we can do is admit we have blindness or blind spots or flaws or weaknesses um, and let down those defenses, not ignore, not deny, not avoid. Now, this is easier said than done. I know you know that. It's much easier, even, it's much easier to see other people's blindness. I mean, even if you know you've got some flaws, it's still easier to talk about other people's. Do you know the story about the husband who came to his wife and he said, honey, I want to talk about your flaws. And she said, like I would have said, what? You want to talk about my flaws? What about your flaws? And he said, they're not the ones that bother me. (laughs) Blindness comes in in all shapes and forms, right? Countries, countries have certain themes of blindness. Some countries' blindness is workaholism. Others is perfectionism. Others is withholding praise. Um, I, there's also generational blindness that is, exists in our families. Um, there's really a great painting. And this, in this painting, it's the blind leading the blind. And when the first person falls into a ditch, chaos happens because now everybody else after that person because they're all blind is falling into the ditch and it reminded me of generational blindness and that we have families that repeat the same patterns over and over again um, each generation whether it be avoidance or whether it be blaming or whether it be not knowing how to handle money well or not knowing how to talk about our hurts or not knowing how to nurture tenderness in our families. There's also cultural blindness. Um, A few, uh, let's see, a few months ago, early in the summer, Pete and I had the opportunity to take a road trip with some friends. These are friends of mine that I grew up with uh, since kindergarten, so very long time. We know each other pretty well. And except that this road trip was down the Colorado River. We, we rafted 180 miles to the Grand Canyon for six days. So it was a road trip in a raft through the Grand Canyon. Now, if you know anything about road trips, you really get to know people, right? When you're in that car for six days in tight quarters, 
you know, temperature of the car, radio stations, podcasts, whatever, you know, when you're going to stop, what are you going to eat, all those kinds of things. And they sometimes don't always, they bring out the truth, they bring out who we really are. And so um, here's our little group, <clears throat> or one part of our little group. Hmm. Whoops. And uh, there were days on the river that were, just exhilarating because, you know, we could barely catch our breath between the amount of rapids we went through. Some of them over, uh, some of them had a gradual over a few seconds, 30 foot drops. So they were big. It was a lot of white water and very exhilarating. But there was also moments of real quiet and tranquility with one another. And there we are uh, next to the mile high canyon. But about third day into the trip, Pete looks at me and he says, oh my goodness, they're just like you. <laughs> and then he said, I thought it was just your family, but it's the whole Irish American culture. And it's true, I grew, I grew up in an enclave of Irish Americans, and we all went to the same school, we all lived in the same neighborhood, we all went to the same church. And so after three days, being with my people, <laughs> the sarcasm came out, the, the, uh, the opinionatedness came out, which really means we're right and you're wrong. The, the judgmentalism and the contempt was seeping into our facial expressions and our tone of voice. And so we became, I became very aware. I just laughed because I wasn't blind to that. My husband was. Um, but I want to talk about personal blindness. And, you know, scripture is filled almost so many stories of people who are really blind to who God created them to be, and then they, you know, it's, it's just an ongoing growth of gaining sight. Uh, but one of my favorite character, one of my favorite blind characters in the Bible is Martha. And there's Mary and Martha and Jesus, and this is uh, the passage where Martha has been dreaming about having Jesus and his friends over for dinner. She's probably been thinking about it for weeks and thinking about what she's going to serve and how she's going to fix her house and the meal she's going to prepare and, and how, I mean, everybody's going to think what a great person she is and what a kind person she is and what a helpful person she is and what a talented person she is because she's doing all these things. So Jesus arrives at Martha's house. She opens the door. She gives him a big hug. And that's where the hospitality ended. Okay, because right after that, Martha is beginning to have growing frustration and anxiety. Things are not unfolding the way she pictured them. She's, the passage says she's distracted, she's worried, she's frustrated, she's anxious. She's upset. As a matter of fact, here, at this moment, she's kind of at the height of her anxiety and she says to Jesus, basically, even you're implicated in this thoughtlessness. You're enabling my sister to, to not even help me to participate in the serving. But what's so sad about this story and true is that Martha cannot see her own blindness. She is steeped in blindness. She's steeped in blindness in this moment. She actually sees everybody else as the problem. She cannot see that she is the problem. I so relate to Martha, I get, put my head on her body. There I am. She can't see her blame. She can't see the numerous assumptions she's making. Uh, she can't see her need to control. She can't see that her way, it's got to be her way, or she thinks her way is the right way. 
She's not in touch with her fears. That's really causing the anxiety. Or her um, less than loving motivations that are really driving her behavior. This dinner is actually really more about Martha and how other people will see her and perceive her than it is about Jesus. And a recent illustration of my own blindness happened a few weeks ago. Uh, Pete and I have a, we have a a principle we really try and follow, and I think we do it pretty well, and that is that we never give our adult children, I have four adult daughters, we never give our adult daughters advice unless they ask for it. But I felt like this one instance might merit it. And I wanted to approach one of my daughters about something that I was concerned about. It was a health issue I was concerned about. And so I had given it some, I'd given it considerable thought. And so thoughtfully I approached her. When I broached the subject of the health issue that I was concerned about, I immediately could see the hurt and the anger in her eyes. But it was the hurt that killed me. And I realized, oh, something's happening here. Things aren't going as I expected. And she said to me, Mom, you've been talking to me about this for so many years. And at that moment, I looked at her literally like she had 10 heads, like she was a mythological creature because I never recollected speaking to her about it. But she's telling me I've been saying this for years. Now, as a result of that interaction, and especially the, the mutual hurt that we were experiencing, I needed, I, just, I needed to get some time alone to process her words, her hurt. And when I got alone um, with God, I realized and, and, and began to, you know, God's grace began to open up my heart a little bit, and those words kept coming back to me so many years. So I've been saying this for so many years. And my, there's no reason for my daughter not to, to uh, tell the truth about that. There's absolutely no reason. So I really was able to internalize, wow, of course she's telling the truth. I have been saying this for years, but I have been blind to it. Why have I been so blind to this? And so I realized that ultimately, as my heart was, there was a a crack there and some light was getting in, that maybe the health concern I had was really more about me than her. That there was an issue that, Uh, where she maybe wasn't being what, like, I think she should be or act like I should be or do how I would do or or whatever. But there was something where it was a little too close to my, the issue was more close to my identity than hers. And so I went back to her and I said, first of all, honey, I am so sorry and sad that I hurt you. I was not aware that I have been talking to you. I have been blind to that. So this is really new information for me, I said to her. But today I heard you loud and clear, and I promise to never bring it up to you again. And I said to her, I know you value your health, and you don't need my help. Let me mention two important reminders before we go on to the next heart posture. Around Two reminders around personal blindness. One, what you resist will persist. What you resist will persist, whether it's a splinter in your foot, 
And you know how that goes when we ignore it or avoid it or hope it'll just go away. Or whether it's a pain in your heart. What we resist, whatever blindness we resist, it'll persist. But secondly, a second reminder around personal blindness, pay attention to when you are being triggered by someone or something. When somebody brings a big reaction out of you, an overreaction. Because in those moments, something is being touched in you, usually an unconscious fear. And you are on holy ground. So when you are being triggered or you are having a reaction, a beautiful way to approach it is to just pause and say, oh, I'm on holy ground right now. Because I love what Leonard Cohen, the singer-songwriter, says. He writes, there is a crack in everything. And where there's a crack, the light can get in. There is a crack in everything, and where there's a crack, the light can get in. Next, the second heart posture. To know that Jesus is near. Two of the most beautiful words in this passage in all of Scripture are this. Jesus stood still. Jesus stood still in the midst of the noise, the crowd, the chaos. Jesus hears this one person's voice on top of all of that noise. The same goes for us. Above our own internal noise or exterior noise or life's noise, when you cry out, when you know Jesus is near, you can know he's standing still to hear you. Author Juliet Benner writes this, Awareness of nothing beyond my preoccupations means a lack of awareness of God's presence. So you and I know what it's like to drive or take a bus or subway, uh, and maybe even sometimes walk from point A to point B. You've just driven from point A to point B. And it can be, that can be a significant distance sometimes, and we have no idea how we got there. It's scary, isn't it? When all of a sudden you go, oh my goodness, because our minds are somewhere else. I can be sitting in my chair like I was last night, and I got up to go over to do something, and I was only going about 10 feet, but my mind was filled as I walked that 10 feet. I could not remember what I walked that 10 feet for. We live in a state of impartial uh, attention. We, we live in a, with a lot of inattention, a lot of distraction, but Presence of anything can be a door to awareness of God's presence. That is so encouraging. That's why pauses in our day to be mindful of his presence are so important. Presence of anything can be a door to awareness of God's presence. Last week, if you were here, or if you watched online, Marie Wood uh, spoke, and there was a moment in the message in which she shared about her experience of the nearness of God. And I don't know if you remember it, but it is, it was and is, when she looks into her five boys' faces. When she looks into her five boys' faces, or any one of their faces, and she's looking into them, and she's looking at their eyes, or their smile, or their frown, or whatever is happening in that face. There's a joy, and there's a love, and there's a delight that just bubbles up in her that she can only attribute to the nearness and the love of God. Now, if she's experiencing such delight 
and, and experiencing the delight and love of God and nearness of God, when she looks into those boys' eyes, can you imagine what those boys are experiencing when they see their mother seeing them with such delight? And how that's an experience of the nearness of Christ's presence and the love of God for them. Well, I was contemplating Christ's nearness. I was actually sitting on a beach, and um, I'm staring out into the ocean, you know, thinking about, uh, at first I had my eyes closed, then I had my eyes open, just looking out in the ocean, thinking about the nearness of Christ. And then all of a sudden, I kind of blinked, and right there in front of me is a seagull. Now, most, for most beachgoers, seagulls are really annoying birds. Uh, they steal your food, and they're just, they're, they're usually annoying. And I, I've known, I've uh, been around seagulls all my life. But in this particular moment, I saw a seagull like I never saw a seagull before. And it was as if I was, here I am asking, and, and asking God to know his nearness, and the seagull was like right here. I, I mean, he, I don't know how long he was there, but I didn't see him initially. But when I allowed myself to open my eyes and be present, what, what was present around me, I saw the seagull. And I saw this amazing God creature. First of all, I noticed the amazing colors. He had this bright, and you, this doesn't justify it. This doesn't do it justice. Bright yellow beak, which matched bright yellow feet. And then his colors, the white uh, flowed into different shades of then off-white, then light gray, and then dark gray. I mean, the colors were awesome. And I immediately thought to myself, oh, that bright yellow and those different shades of white and gray, that's a great palette for a room and a home. <laughs> and so many of our palettes for, for clothes and homes come from creation. Okay, and then the next day, my nephew, my nephew's son, brought me this crab claw. And immediately I said to him, Noah, look at the colors. They're the same colors in your bathing suit. The, he had, I don't know if you can see the orange. He's got orange, he's got blue, he's got yellow, and they were all the same colors of the crab claw. And God says, he, he often points us, right, to nature, or, or to that which is right around us, to see that he is near. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the fish of the sea. Look how I clothe the flowers. If I take care of them, how much more will I take care of you? Scripture says the earth is filled with his glory. But we only have to be awake and present to see it. Christ is near. Some of you have already read this for the, in the Jolly, Charlie Brown um, slide, but you may remember how God met you in the past, and you wait with hope for how we trust God will meet us in the future. But this is the important line. But we can only actually meet God in the present moment. That's why he's called the great I am. He lives in the now. You may remember how God met you in the past, and you wait for hope, how, he's gonna, how you'll trust him in the future. But we can only actually meet God in the present. Third posture. Third heart and mind posture to make sure we're turned in the right direction. You can say, I know I need mercy. Mercy's, you know, mercy, mercy, mercy's emphasized in Scripture from the beginning to the end. It is a very major theme in Scripture. In Luke 15, Jesus says, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. Now, that sounds to me like God likes sinners better than righteous people. Is that true? No. 
Jesus is trying to make a point here. And the point is, we are all sinners. Author, theologian, Ron Rawheiser writes this. He says, you know, there's two kinds of people. Those who admit they're sinners and those who don't. God likes it better when we admit we're sinners. There are no righteous people, only Jesus. It's not a question of whether you're a sinner. It's only a question of what is your sin? We are all in need of mercy. Now, Bartimaeus's cry, his recognition, his awareness, his sight, and his need for mercy is huge because right before this passage, uh, something very sobering for us to hear. Right before this incident, an interaction Jesus has with Bartimaeus, Jesus is with all his disciples. James and John take him aside, and they say this to Jesus. James and John, sons of Zebedee, they came forward to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, Do you recognize this question? This is the same exact question Jesus asks Bartimaeus. He had just asked his disciples this question, and this is how they responded. They said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in glory. Now, what they're really asking for is power. They want power. They want prestige. They want control. They want entitlement. They want popularity. They want a platform. In this, at this time in their lives, the disciples are not turned in the right direction. Isn't it amazing that though they're not turned in the right direction, even though they're disciples of his and following him and trying to learn from him, Bartimaeus has the right heart and mind posture. Bartimaeus is turned in the right direction because he's asked, he recognizes his need for mercy. Why do we need mercy? First of all, because none are righteous. But I love how Paul articulates it in Romans 7. And I think we can all relate to this. We all have the same inner struggle that Paul had. The good I want to do, I don't do. And the evil I don't want to do, I do. And we have this struggle going on inside of us. How many of us wake up in the morning and say, okay, today I'm going to be like Mother Teresa. <laughs> it's going to be a Mother Teresa day. And you feel great until you meet your until the first tantrum of your toddler, or until the subways aren't working, or until you get to work and that person makes that comment, and it's just an old spiral downward. We long to be good. We long to be perfect. But we are fragile and we are broken. I want to be perfect. I want you to be perfect. I want a perfect world. Jesus even says... Be perfect, like your heavenly Father is perfect. The thing is, that word perfect there, it means not flawless. It means merciful. It means compassionate. To be perfect, and that's such a good word for us perfectionists, be merciful. That's what it means to be perfect, like God is perfect. Be compassionate. We also need mercy, though, because mercy begets mercy. In other words, in order to really be merciful and be compassionate, to think compassionately, act compassionately, pray compassionately, you've got to have first received it. 
I have to receive it. Then I can do mercy and be compassionate. So in summary, Jesus is asking you this morning, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? You know, this is a really, really important question. Thomas Keating, who has been, he's an author, and he's a follower of Christ, and he's in his 90s now. And he's been a faithful follower for many, many years. So for, for me, his words carry such weight. He says this, at the time of conversion, we orient our lives by the question, God, what can I do for you? But as we progress in the spiritual journey, the question ought to become, God, what can you do for me? Now, that is not a narcissistic question. That's a question of a humble person like Bartimaeus who recognizes they're blind, recognizes Jesus is near and and that he's merciful and that he's compassionate. When we see who God really is, we're going to say, oh God, what can you do for me? And maybe more importantly, what can you do in me? He wants to free us. Just like he freed Bartimaeus. I can imagine Bartimaeus hearing those words, like Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? And then Bartimaeus is saying them in his head, oh, what do I want you to do for me, Jesus? What do I want you to do for me? Can you ask yourself that question this morning? What do I want you to do for me? Maybe it's a question of, Lord, help me to see where I'm blind. Jesus, help me to see that you're, you're, you're here. You're standing still right now for me. And you're safe and you're approachable. You're compassionate. And you want to wrap me in your mercy. Or, Lord, I really, I need your mercy. I really want to receive your mercy. And so I want to give us a chance. I'm going to invite Kate to come forward. And she's going to sing a song that we're going to actually, we can pray in our hearts. It's, a, it's really a prayer. It's really a song that's a prayer. It's by Leonard Cohen. It's called Come Healing. Because we're asking to be healed. Where we're blind that we might see. Uh, and so... We can't put the words on the screen because of copyright issues, but here are a couple of the words, some of the words. It starts out by saying, Oh, gather up the brokenness and bring it to me now. The fragrance of those promises you never dared to vow. The splinters that you carry, the cross you left behind. Oh, come healing of the body, come healing of the mind. So I want to invite you to into a, a these heart these are heart and mind postures ultimately of surrender this this is not about self improvement i love self help books i get a lot out of many self help books but ultimately because of our nature we don't do the good we want to do we do the evil we don't want to do ultimately God's grace has to come in through the cracks, shine his light on us, where we can surrender to him, receive sight, receive mercy. So I just want to invite you to be quiet and allow God to, or, and, allow, and invite you to receive whatever seeds God has for you and has been given to you during this time. And then I'll, I'll come back and close. Also, though, for those of you that may have a hard time closing your eyes and, and listening and hearing the song, there'll be some images on the screen that you can uh, focus on. Oh, gather up 
After one of the services, someone came up to me and he said, Jerry, I'm so blind. And I just looked at him and I said, that's so much sight. To acknowledge our blindness is a huge leap into sight. And so uh, I want to pray for us and bless you and encourage you as you leave this place, uh, remembering discipleship is a lifetime journey, but these three heart and mind postures will keep you in the right direction. You know you're blind, you know Jesus is near, and you know you live in a state of needing mercy. Amen? Why don't you stand with me and um, I will bless you. <clears throat> and so, Father, we thank you for your glorious grace that comes after us. And, Father, I pray blessing on my brothers and sisters this morning, and I pray that they would have the courage of Bartimaeus. And I pray that they would know your nearness, and not just your nearness, but the, the, the God that you are. You're, you are safe. You are approachable. You are attentive. You are full of mercy 
And I pray you would wrap them in that mercy and in that compassion in a palpable way to them. That they might leave here uh, growing in more freedom to know your love in a deeper way and then bring that love to the world. In Christ's name I pray, amen. 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 Oh, sorry, Rich. Let's have our prayer teams come to my left, those offering the bread and the cup to come to my right. And the Christian life, I love how Jerry has said all day today, what does it mean to be turned in the right direction? Repentance, which is the call of every Christian, not just a one-time thing, but every day is being turned in the right direction. What it means to repent I'm going this way, and now Jesus is calling me to go that way. And to confess I am blind, to confess Jesus is near, to confess I need mercy are wonderful postures of repentance. For some of you today, uh, to enter into a state of sight, and Jerry mentioned this at the first service, and I wrote it down, because to go from darkness into light is often disorienting. If you come out of a dark room and go into light, your eyes hurt, it's hard for you, it's disorienting. And to come out of darkness into God's marvelous light is not just a wonderful day in the park. Sometimes it's disorienting, and yet it's a good disorientation. And so for those of you who you sense that confession of I'm blind, you just need someone to pray with you, to cover you with words of God's grace and God's mercy. For those of you... To confess Jesus is near. You've had a hard time believing that Jesus is near. And you need someone to just come alongside you to remind you and to pray with you and pray for you that God is with you, that he's near, that he'll never leave you or forsake you. And every one of us in this room, as Jerry so eloquently said today, we need mercy. Every single day, God's mercy. And so feel free to come up for prayer. Uh, We'll have the Lord's table here as well. Um, Let me bless you all, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, confessing that we are blind, but that Jesus is near and that we need mercy. And may you be a great gift to the world around you. May you be the very presence of Jesus to someone in deep need. And may you offer the mercy of Jesus to those who desperately need it. I bless you all today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the present name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Grace and peace, everyone.